we're seeing with with central bank withdrawal of liquidity, the magnitude of that, along with the move in, in the dollar and along with the move in interest rates, um, not only on the short end, really across the entire curve, um, is, is a huge impact in the global economy. We simply cannot sustain that uh, going forward. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. The signs the global economy is heading into recession continue to mount. If you haven't seen them, you're about to. Tavi Costa of Crescent Capital has put together a chart series that visualizes the economic slowdown clearly. And on the day we recorded this interview, Bloomberg Economics reveals its models now predict a 100% probability that a recession will happen within the next 12 months. So how bad will it get? What will the impact be on markets and are there opportunities for investors to protect and possibly prudently grow their wealth as the recession unfolds? We'll get Tavi's answers to all of those questions. Tavi, thanks so much for joining us today. Adam, thanks for having me again. Hey, it's a pleasure. Uh, I know we kind of missed each other as ships in the night uh, at the New Orleans conference uh, last week. Um, so I'm looking forward to catching up with you in depth here. Um, let's start just by kicking things off with the usual high-level question I like to ask. Um, what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? I'm quite worried because it's, it feels like the, the bullish thesis is really predicated right now on oversold technical indicators, but the, there are times in markets when you have uh, the only relevant driver really is the macro uh, research. And so Right now, the backdrop is extremely bearish from the liquidity standpoint and also policy making standpoint. And real bottoms in markets are usually uh, really marked by those pivotal moments in, in policy making and also at times when the markets is historically cheap. But we haven't seen those yet. And so we have this, this entire debate in the markets right now where folks are overly using those technical indicators because everything looks cheap on, on, a, on a technical basis, right? If you look at the percentage of, of companies below their 200 day moving average, for instance, would be a great example. But then you look at where market cap, US market cap for equity markets relative to GDP is, it's just retesting the peak of the tech bubble. So the unwinding of all this is, is, is very severe. Uh, and I think there's a lot more to go. And more importantly, Adam, where, what, what's really in my mind, it's what's the roadmap for risky assets from here? And to me, it, when I look at the darlings of this last bull cycle, w which ones are those? I mean, it's, it's venture capital, it's ARK investments, it's Chinese stocks, it's software stocks, it's the Netflix of the world, it's the Facebooks of the world. All of them are right now either at either below or very close to the March lows of 2020. And so to me, that's a roadmap for the overall equity markets, which remains at about 40%. S&P remains about 40% above where it was at the very bottom of that March low. And so to me, that's really where we're headed towards. But it will take a while for that to develop. We'll have bear market rallies. We'll have moments where you lose faith on that roadmap. But I think ultimately, that's that's where we're going to go. OK, wow, great answer. And that's a great um, ending point there, which is if you look at where sort of the most speculative assets have gone, they're back down to the March 2020 lows. But everything else still has a, a ways to go to get there. And if, if you know, your macro outlook is correct, um, we can basically say, look, this bear market's not over, at least until the general market gets down to those levels. That's a great sort of indicator to look at. Um, all right. Well, as I mentioned, you, you have a specific tweet thread that I want to walk through in a moment because I think it does a really good job of just sort of visualizing the case for, for substantial recession ahead. Um, real quick, though, you at Crescent, you focus on tangible assets, the things that are used to kind of build power and feed the world. I mean, these are the, the, the atoms, right? These are the real things flowing around the global economy. Um, just at, 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 a, at a general level, what are their current pricing and flows telling you about the global economy's direction right now? And I'll give you one example. 
um, this is this is price, not volumes. But if we look at global shipping container rates, they're plummeting yeah. right now, right? Which is a sign that you know economically there's just not nearly as much demand for shipping as we had you know two years ago. And of course, shipping costs got totally distorted uh, out of their their normal ranges because of all the the, the COVID shutdown and and resp re respondent uh, supply chain. Uh, issues. Um, but it is a, showing a massive deceleration of just sort of things moving. So what is all this data telling you? I mean, it's been difficult because the commodity market is certainly a, a place where you can find the macro fundamental, even technical and sentiment thesis very strongly still. Um, and and it, it is a long-term view about uh, what's likely to play out in terms of that, that part of the market. Um, you know, the commodities to equity ratio is, is just starting to move uh, at a higher pace. In other words, natural resource companies have just started to uh, outperform those companies. But now we're seeing really a, a liquidity crash recently that has caused correlations to go to one. So precious metals specifically got uh, really caught up on, onto this base metals as well. Energy continues to actually diverge from uh, from the overall equity markets, which is quite interesting. Um, in our view, it's it's a time to be owning a basket of, of those. But what, what tells us actually is, look, the markets had a decline about 48% back in 73, 74 during an inflationary recession to get the CPI index uh, to start trending lower. Uh, right now, we've had a decline of about 20% in S&P, uh, NASDAQ decline got about 35% or so. If you look at the year-over-year -year change in the equal weighted basket of commodities, they're only down 1%. So, you know, hmm. there's not only a divergence between the two uh, in some parts of the natural resource space, uh, but also it's, it's how much it takes for the demand side to, to decline in order to cause those prices to uh, uh, to be uh, reflecting the demand side of it, and so the supply the supply part is is extremely important. I remember stumbling in onto the the capex chart three years ago uh, when we started posting those charts of of how capex was so depressed for natural resource companies, uh, and that is really what the cycle of commodities uh, uh, needs in order to see a big turn on the bullish side. And to me, the same chart today uh, that I think it's, it's even more relevant because everyone knows about this CAPAC situation, uh, to me really is the manufacturing chart, the manufacturing uh, of, of part of GDP in developed economies. I think the same way people were sharing those CAPAC charts around Twitter and other places, even uh, newspapers and so forth, we're going to see the same thing with the percentage of manufacturing in developed economies relative to other, other times in history. So the US, for instance, used to have close to 30% of manufacturing relative to GDP. And today is only about 10%. This is really telling from what's happening on the deglobalization trends that we're seeing, this, this, uh, this move towards reducing the reliance from China uh, of being the manufacturing plan of the global economy and to me, that's going to be the, the driver for most of those uh, commodities over time. Um, and, and Adam, think about just the oil itself. I mean, oil is an important one because it's very cyclical and it's also very well linked to, to what's happening in the global economy. I don't remember the last time we've had uh, China imploding, the largest importer of oil. Um, you've had the U.S. government selling their strategic petroleum reserves, mm -hmm. you have the Fed tightening monetary conditions the way it is, and not only the Fed, but central bank liquidity has been uh, you know, uh, collapsing in, over the last months or so. And the dollar move uh, is another thing that tends to be a headwind for, the, for, for, for oil. And despite all those things, we're still seeing oil prices at historically high levels. Right, persisting that, in the 90% of barrel range, $90 a barrel range. Yeah. And so that reflects how much, you know, the tightness in the supply side really is. And we haven't changed anything there. I mean, production in the U.S. is flat right now. Um, if you look at the amount of rigs, uh, active rigs in, in the U.S., they just started contracting for the first time in two to three years. So, you know, when you start thinking about this, I mean, we're not fixing the problem. Um, the, the tightening of monetary conditions is just making the availability of credit and capital 
even, even more difficult for those businesses. Um, and, and as you mentioned, we are in the business of, of funding a lot of those companies. They are, they are facing a real problem right now, particularly in the mining space, where it's becoming increasingly difficult to raise capital in this environment. And so, I mean, I, I don't know. Either the government's going to have to get involved, you know, providing subsidies, um, providing some level of support where those companies can acquire capital and fix the supply issues. Now we're pretending that those by hitting the demand, we're fixing the supply problem, but we're not. And so it's, you know, it, it is difficult to use that. My, I guess my final point is that it's difficult to use that as a real gauge for what's happening with economic activity, because it's just not falling more because the supply side is just so tight across the board from base metals, precious metals, energy, agricultural, and so forth. Okay, great. So you kind of got to the punchline of my arc early here, which is good, um, which you know, basically is saying, look, we have a lot of structural supply issues that are going to haunt us uh, for a long time from here, e even if we started doing the right things today, because a lot of the deficit and the CapEx and things that you mentioned has been going on for decade plus, right? decades even in certain cases. So um, uh, e even though we're about to go through a journey here that's really going to focus more on the demand side uh, coming down, um, what you're saying here is, is um, we need to be focused on that because that's going to be sort of the immediate uh, trauma that we're going to see more and more of over the next year. But we have to keep in our minds that the the longer the supply issues go unaddressed, we are just going to be, you know, hurtling towards no matter what happens with demand, we're hurtling, going to be hurtling towards a greater supply crisis if we don't change a lot of our policies and practices. Is that true? Yeah. And I, I think there are some huge correlations being, you know, broken right now in, in markets. I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when Japanese yen was the strongest currency and safest currency in the planet. And it's not anymore. You have that as a chart uh, relative to gold prices. There is a divergence between the two more recently. You can do the same with global bonds. Global bonds have been collapsing and gold has been holding up well. They used to be very, very tightly correlated. And so while we're, you know, we're seeing this damage in gold prices and some other tangible assets being caught up into this, you know, market liquidity issues that we're facing. Uh, it's it's really not as bad as the overall part of the economy. I mean, the economy. I mean, what we're seeing with with central bank withdrawal of liquidity, the magnitude of that, along with the move in in the dollar, and along with the move in interest rates, um, not only on the short end, really across the entire curve. Um, is, is a huge impact in the global economy. We simply cannot sustain that uh, going forward. You know, the, the global economy requires financial, a, a financially repressed environment to allow inflation rates to stay elevated uh, at historically standards um, and, uh, and allow the economy as well to deleverage over time. And so you know, that's what we need. And so it's a very tricky environment uh, when it comes to you know, the vulnerability of, of what's happening in the global economy, given the, the macro imbalances that have been built uh, of the easy money policies that we've had over the years um, is, is, you know, is now showing those issues. And so in order to keep equity markets at those valuations that we currently have, you simply have to have, um, you can't have this, this withdrawal of liquidity. And so you know, we're seeing the unwinding of all this. And on top of it, uh, this is the point of, of that tweet, which was related to where I think the consumer is the next shoe to drop. It, it hasn't really dropped yet, but it is going to get squeezed from many fronts. You look at savings rates, now at historical lows. You look what's happening with real wages. Wages are not outpacing inflation. Um, you look at just simply on what's happening with mortgage rates, uh, you know, making you know, all seven highs right now. Uh, so, so how in the world will the consumer really spend capital? And, and on top of it, you have now earnings for corporations, because if you have consumption being squeezed, well, the next shoe to drop from there is then corporate earnings, which remains right. the new highs. 
And then you have the move on the dollar, which usually a move on the dollar has a negative impact on earnings. So it's just very difficult to be bullish uh, on, on fundamentals and, and what's going to be here uh, unfolding. So to me, the only way you can make up a case on, on, on being bullish in risky assets really is um, the sentiment perhaps is a little more negative than usual. Um, the technical indicators are more oversold than usual. Um, and maybe those inflated forecasts for earnings, which is a huge part of the problem. I mean, anytime I see, you know, forward PE ratios, uh, you know, it's actually, in fact, it's right here on Wall Street Journal, the front page of Wall Street Journal right now is the forecast for earnings and showing the price to forecast at earnings being at multi-year lows. But that's the issue is that it's an inflated metric that is not really showing the, the, the entire problem. So I think there's a lot more to go down here in terms of risky assets in my view, Adam. All right, great answer there, Tavi. And um, I'm, I, I'm glad that you brought the front page of the paper up there. Um, that, that is nuts. So we've talked with a number of experts on this channel recently about how unrealistically rosy our earnings estimates still are for 2023. And so um, basically that's saying that PEs are, are you know now looking relatively attractive, but that's because the E component uh, is still living in fantasy land, right? So if we actually had realistic forward earnings projections, well, then the PE ratios would probably look a lot richer than they are right now. That's right. I mean, if we go back to the 70s during that very early parts of, of, of that decade, which is even though it's not a perfect analog for today, given the fact that the debt problem is much larger and valuation problem is much larger. At that time, we did see corporate earnings decline by you know, close to over 30% uh, in real terms uh, during the very first part of the decade. And so you know, I think that's, that's sort of a, a plausible uh, scenario uh, to, uh, to corporate earnings. In fact, if you look at the earnings estimates right now, and another reason why P or price relative to uh, forecasted earnings uh, remain highly attractive is because they are massively inflated. They're expecting an increase of about 30% uh, by 2025. I, I just don't believe that that's going to be the case. And so there is a real squeeze of margins happening through labor costs, through material costs. And on top of it, now you're going to see the squeeze also coming from the consumption side of it. Uh, and let's not forget what's happening with the dollar, which is also reflecting, uh, you know, a big problems when it comes to earnings uh, in the future. So yeah, if you're a multinational, that's really crimping your ex-US profits. Yep. That's right. And on top of it now as well, which we should not forget, is what's happening with yields, right? I mean, what's happening with 10-year yields across the globe is, you know, is also a, a huge problem, huge part of the problem. You know, uh, I would say central banks can talk a hawkish language until you have uh, their bond market becoming dysfunctional. Uh, then, then you start seeing some real problems in, in, in those in those in those economies. And that's certainly what's beginning to unleash in some parts of the globe already with Japan, uh, the BOE and, and so forth. And there's more to go on that list. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I'm I very concerned about, um, about what is ahead. I mean, like I said, the darlings of the market are already making those lows. Um, and so it's hard to believe we're not gonna see uh, the S&P ultimately hitting that level as well. Okay. Um, also, just want to mention too, when you talked about rising yields, we were talking about margin compression. That's raising the cost of capital as well, which contributes to the margin compression problem too. Okay. So let's dive into this, this tweet thread. So uh, in it, you wrote that consumer demand is about to fall off a cliff and predicted the onset of a quote, vicious stagflationary environment. I want to give you the opportunity to really explain that in detail. So you go through a number of charts in this tweet thread. I'll just sort of start going through them and we can we can proceed any way you like here. Um, but the first one is a chart of collapsing consumer sentiment, um, which you predict is going to end up tanking corporate profits, presumably because the more, you know, 
bearish people think or pessimistic they are, the more likely they are to start tightening their pocketbooks. Yeah. Well, that's one huge part of it. And usually there's a lot of contrarian indicators uh, that are showing, uh, in my view, they're very reliable. You know, one of them is peak earnings, you know, you, you're, or, or unemployment rates where most of the labor markets, uh, which has been the, the big focus of majority of policymakers, uh, and we're yet to see that translate into becoming an issue because, you know, as you see consumption getting squeezed and then you have the corporate side getting squeezed, you got the margins. And at some point that translates into unemployment rates and other problems. But on the margin, you're starting to see that already with job openings and so forth. And the stagflationary environment we're facing right now is, is it is worse than what we saw back in the 70s because uh, it is really driven by a time when even the 70s or the 40s, which were both inflationary periods, especially the 40s, was a time where we were finishing that deglobalized environment. Now we're entering one. And, and this is a huge problem from a labor cost perspective. What we're going to see in terms of, 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 of those squeezes from margins in terms of what's happening uh, with the rise of, of, of labor costs in general by reducing the reliance on, on cheap places like China to operate, this is going to be huge. I mean, I think, I think there's going to be, uh, there is a, a real concern for some, some large black swan events in currency markets being driven by those changes in, 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 in policy making across the globe. I mean, I've been saying this for a while, which is related to this issue of, of the stagflationary environment we're facing across the globe. FX markets are yet to show some true volatility issues that we've seen back in the 80s and 90s when guys, macro guys used to make real money uh, by trading those, those vehicles at those times. And we haven't seen much of that yet. Uh, look at credit spreads right now. Credit spreads, when was the last time, Adam, that we saw a decline of 30% in NASDAQ in credit spreads stay sub 2%? So that is yet to start moving. Um, and, and so there's, there's so many ways of, of, of seeing this issue. And one thing I know, we were talking about the break of correlations in markets, and I pay very close attention to the price behavior of assets because I think that's one of the most telling things that you can find. And, and one of the things that I noted is to see, to see the magnitude of the change in terms of, of, of the Federal uh, Reserve stance, usually that tends to be terrible for economies like the Brazilian economy, right? When, when you have those issues, uh, it tends to be, it tends to kill the Brazilian economy, it tends to kill their FX market. Usually you see major devaluations on the back of those policies. And Instead, we're not seeing that. We're seeing actually a relative performance of Brazilian equities relative to U.S. equities, which is, uh, you know, nothing more than, than impressive in my view. It's very impressive. <laughs> and so uh, to me, that's a sign that, that we're entering an inflationary decade um, that will unleash a lot of opportunities. And some of them will be commodities, commodity-led economies, uh, but developed economies that are highly indebted, uh, that, are, that have really benefited from this globalized environment, uh, I think are gonna be facing some big issues. And, and that's the US, that's Europe, that's UK, um, uh, along with Europe, obviously, uh, Japan, uh, and, and the list goes on. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I, I do wanna talk about kind of the opportunity side of some of these emerging markets um, when we get to the, hey, how should we position for all of this? Um, but for now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue going through the, the hit list of, uh, of developments that are likely going to bring this, these developed markets, like you said, into probably further pain uh, over the next 12 months. Um, okay, so again, another chart I'm going to put up here of yours showing uh, that consumers are at a breaking point while real wages fall worse than they did during the global financial crisis. Uh, and saving rates plummet. So you kind of have the, 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 you know, you get the worst of both worlds here. You know, their, their, their real income uh, is buying less and they're able to save less as a result. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and uh, I, I feel like, you know, folks have, uh, and this is an issue with when you have an inflationary problem, uh, usually is, is the lack of understanding of how it develops 
in the system over time. And that's, you know, I don't blame people. It's just developed economies and, and folks that live in developed economies just, just really not live through those periods uh, in many, many decades. And when they did, they were too young. And usually that's what tends to happen is, is that cost of living uh, stays highly elevated for much longer than you can think. And the other thing that happens as well is that businesses, when they start uh, really facing the contraction of, of, of growth in terms of their own businesses, they begin to raise their own prices, uh, not the other way around, like we saw in the prior two decades. And this is counterintuitive because in a, this, this inflationary environment like we've had over the last two to three decades, usually you see the opposite. As you see issues emerging, uh, you tend to see business uh, actually cutting their prices and so forth. But in an inflationary environment, when uh, we change this, this real uh, kind of a reflexive uh, movement uh, and self-reinforcing over time as well uh, of, of consumers uh, it being okay with, with the, riser, uh, the rise in, in cost of goods and services, uh, that, that becomes a, a real issue. And so I think um, you know, those, those are the concerns when you look at the, the, the savings rates right now. I mean, at, the, at levels that we haven't seen in, in many decades, uh, it, it is a real concern. Where will uh, consumption come from? Um, and, and there is a, a little case to be made. Um, there's still more leveraging to come from the consumer side. Uh, when we had the 2020 crisis uh, during the COVID crash, uh, what actually happened during that period was that the government took on the debt uh, imbalance uh, uh, at that time. And so it, it sort of saved up uh, the corporate and the consumption side of it or the consumer side of it of not having to lever up during that period of crisis. Uh, and so we've had uh, government debt shooting up, uh, but but the other two, actually we saw, we experienced deleveraging, especially on the consumption side. So households actually improve their balance sheets. Uh, and so they have room for growth when it comes to uh, yet their, uh, their, their leveraging process. Uh, and so that will fill the, this inflationary, um, I, in my view, will fill this inflationary uh, uh, forces that we we're going to have for the following years as well in the, in this next decade, uh, along with natural resources, the reckless amount of fiscal spending, and so forth. Um, so it is it is a a, a real concern. I, I do think that we're going to see corporate earnings declining uh, in, in a large way, um, and and it's going to be reflected in prices over time as well. So the economy still has a lot to uh, uh, show in in terms of those issues, uh, in my opinion. Okay, um, so great segue into these next two charts. Um, this this one here shows uh, the U.S. equity market total market cap, uh, and basically shows that um, uh, at least at the time you, you took the snapshot of this chart, the U.S. markets were down over thirteen trillion dollars. I think I've heard that it's it's more like thirty trillion worldwide, but but you know, a, a lot of values already come out of the. The, the the market so far this year and of course you're saying you know looking at the macro outlook it looks like we could go down a lot further um so obviously when people are opening their statements and seeing the type of losses that folks are seeing now uh that creates a negative uh wealth effect uh that that influences their spending um and i'm going to combine this chart with this next one um which shows uh back to us consumer sentiment versus mortgage rates um, you know, sentiments plunging, mortgage rates are shooting the moon. Um, median mortgage payment is now up over 50% year over year. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned many times on this program, uh, housing is much more widely owned than stocks are. Um, so you've got the double shotgun effect from a negative wealth effect standpoint of, you know, people losing money in the stock market, stock and bond markets, but also people looking at their home prices and seeing their home prices under threat now. Um, that is 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 just got to impact consumer spending, which is then going to impact corporate profit margins, correct? Yeah, I think that the housing market is the economy. So you start having that slowdown in housing prices. Uh, it certainly will have an impact in, in consumption as well. Everything is linked. And, uh, you know, we're yet to see as well, you know, we're, we're starting to see some companies starting to to uh, uh, to announce layoffs and, and things like that, that will begin to uh, to translate into problems as well. If you look at no farm 
hey rows right now, which continue to rise. Unfortunately, they actually double count uh, for for uh, folks that actually have more than a job. So so you know those those metrics uh, have not shown uh, much of the pain on the consumption side, uh, but I think it will. Uh, and, and to your point, I mean, if you're thinking about uh, just consumer discretionary, for instance, as a part of the sector, strip out as part of the S and P 500 sector, it's having its worst year in 30 years right now. Uh, so prices are already reflecting a lot of that. Um, I think we're yet to see uh, the mega cap part of, 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 of the markets to really uh, show even further issues. Um, so uh, I think there's the Googles, the Amazons of the world, the Apples, uh, especially, which to me is, is a classic way of, of expressing uh, that, that view about uh, we're entering a, a deglobalized environment. It's hard to believe Apple uh, will be able to, to stay where it is. And so you start thinking about uh, opportunities on the short side uh, in markets. I, I think the mega cap stocks uh, look quite attractive, even Tesla. You know, I keep thinking about uh, uh, consumer discretionary businesses with, with very heavy balance sheets uh, that uh, are yet to show those issues as well. Um, and I'm not saying Tesla or most of those other mega caps actually have balance sheets that are actually too heavy. It's quite the opposite in majority of them, but there are a lot of consumer discretionary companies still. Casinos is a great example of those uh, that are uh, still very heavily uh, indebted uh, and, and are, you know, are probably going to show a lot more issues going forward. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot more damage to be made in, in the economy. Unfortunately, as, as an investor, uh, the, 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 this, this, this drop that we've had recently, this correction in, in equity markets, you have to be very selective on what you're going to be looking at uh, to be short. And so I'm looking for things that are very far from those March lows. And I think the mega cap companies, not Netflix, not, 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 not Facebook, but the other ones uh, are still, you know, at very, very uh, elevated levels in terms of prices uh, is still relative to fundamentals. And a lot of those mega cap companies are still trading at levels that in my opinion are growth, multiples. We're not going to see that most likely uh, with what we're talking about. So um, consumer sentiment, that, that idea of that consumer sentiment uh, impacting margins, it, it's, it's a huge deal uh, because we've had a correlation between margins and consumer sentiment actually being quite strong over the years. Uh, and that break and the divergence of the two is, is, is very telling as well. And I do think consumer sentiment is, is the right uh, uh, index that you want to be uh, uh, focused on because uh, it's hard to believe that corporate margins are going to stay at peak levels. And remember, Adam, uh, margins are, are another contrarian indicator. Uh, usually it tends to be at its peak at the peak of the cycle. There's many other folks that like to make that point, and it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, same thing goes with unemployment rates. And so um, I, think, I think there's 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 unfortunately, there's more to go here in terms of that. And, you know, just the fact that the Federal Reserve is still remains uh, very uh, focused in price stability uh, versus what we've seen in the past. I mean, just looking at global central bank assets relative to the S&P 500, it's the same chart. And so you have that contraction happening uh, recently, uh, the, the real withdrawal of liquidity of the system. It's hard to believe uh, risky assets, particularly equity markets, uh, won't have more of a downside going forward. So I remain very, very concerned about uh, the economy in the U.S., developed economies in general, and I think there's, uh, there's more pain ahead of us. Okay. Um, and hey, that's a really good segue into these, these next two charts, just to visualize some points you made um, or build on them. Um, one, this chart here is a chart of global corporate earnings revisions versus the dollar index. Uh, it's an inverted dollar index. Um, and you can see the correlation here is really strong. Um, but you can see that the dollar has, you know, appreciated violently recently. Um, and on this chart, it's it's the white line that's actually plunging, but it's inverted. Um, and we see that uh, the corporate earnings revisions just have not caught up to it yet. And, and they have a long way to go to catch up with it. So this is one data point uh, Tavi, that you know supports your your call that hey look, um, you know earnings are going to have to come down pretty substantially, and of course that's going to pull valuations down with it. Um, and before you react to that, I'm just going to put up. Well, actually, let me let you react to that one first, and then I'm going to put up a, a a chart of the unemployment rate. 
Yeah, look, I, I think the, the, the dollar, the amount of, of exposure for foreign revenue in the U.S. Is, is, is quite substantial. And this is why you have uh, the decline of, of earnings in general when, when you have this, uh, this move on the dollar. But this move on the dollar that we're seeing recently is kind of, it's, it's really interconnected with the move of interest rate differentials that we're seeing and also with the tightening of monetary conditions and so, you know, you have the U.S. being the reserve currency, being capable of tightening monetary conditions as much as they have uh, in here recently. And, and it's, uh, you know, relative to other parts of the world, it's certainly having a, a real impact on the dollar. And I'm not sure, you know, this is the end of, of the move either. I think there's uh, parts of the, of the dollar curve. That, that looks quite attractive. And that's, you know, in some parts, like I said earlier, uh, relative to, um, you know, the, the Hong Kong dollar and the Chinese yuan. And this is yet to have an impact as well. And, you know, just look at what's happening with the Chinese yuan, which is kind of off the radar right now. And think about how many companies have, you know, linked with, uh, with their earnings in, in, in China in general. And, and this is going to have a, a very important uh, uh, impact as well in their, in their own fundamentals. So I don't know, um, Adam, I think, I think there's a lot more uh, issues on, on the dollar side, on the dollar front. I'm, I'm quite worried that, that we're entering an, an environment where I see three blocks uh, in, in the global economy. It's not to, to, to move away from this conversation, but it's, it's really related to what this dollar move is, is about. I mean, you have parts of the global economy that are focused on uh, really on, on suppressing cost of debt, which used to be the focus of the U.S. a couple of years ago here, and now they allow 10-year yields to move in a significant way. But the, B, the BOJ or the Bank of Japan is a great example of a place that has been suppressing the cost of debt at the, at the cost of their, of their currencies. Of their the currency, currency has yeah. been going away. Uh, in the U.S. and Brazil is a great examples of places that have been focused on price stability. They've been focused on inflation uh, but at the same time, letting uh, their bond market collapse, particularly the U.S. So, you know, when was the last time we've seen a move in treasury markets uh, from a duration perspective like we've seen recently? Um, you know, it's, it's been a very drastic move. And then you have this kind of third group, which is sort of lost. Uh, they're letting their currency go along with their bond market uh, uh, in tandem. And so those are, you know, ECB, right? The, the, the the countries, uh, a part of the ECB, are certainly in that camp right now. So you have the collapse of their bond market along with the euro declining relative to most currencies. And so I'm not sure, you know, uh, how long those those three groups are going to last. I mean, I, I think ultimately every group is going to have to suppress the cost of debt. Like I said earlier, I think of a financially repressed environment, which used to be probably one of the most uh, popular terms of the last two, e two years or so have been forgotten this year because of the tightening of monetary conditions that we've had. Uh, but it's going to have to come back uh, and, and become a, uh, a topic one more time because the economy is ultimately trapped and central banks are ultimately trapped. And we're facing what we call a trifecta of macro imbalances, uh, which is the debt problem of the 40s with the inflation of the 70s and the valuation problem of the late 90s. And that is, you know, it's very difficult uh, to not allow inflation to, uh, to run much higher, uh, given the, the, the real political constraints that are caused for, uh, because of those imbalances. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let me, let me grab onto that. And then I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to the employment situation. Um, so, uh, uh, as you've sort of said several times, you know, in this environment, uh, the Fed is continuing to hike, right? It's continuing to to increase the cost of capital, um, and it is it is well. I guess now it is tightening, and and we're now theoretically at least at the level where the Fed should be doing you know its its QT of removing ninety five billion from the pool every month now. Um, uh, obviously, that that puts us in the position of. Um, what many people are saying is that, okay, the Fed's going to do this until something breaks. Um, you, you've already intimated that we're seeing fracture lines uh, around the rest of the world. Um, 
I, I guess let me be direct here. Do, do you think that, you know, presumably the Fed is doing this mostly because it's trying to bring inflation under control. What do you think is more probable? The Fed actually getting inflation down to two to 3% um, by doing what it's doing and the system still more or less kind of holds together? Or do you see some sort of systemic breakage as more likely to happen before that, which then forces the Fed to pivot, which then doesn't solve the, ref- the inflation issue? I, I think what's allowing the Fed to be as tight as they, as they have been. So in other words, I don't think the first scenario you laid out is, is as likely as, as the second scenario, meaning I think we're going to see a dysfunctional part of the market uh, unfold here. And I, I, you know, it will probably come from the corporate bond market. Um, most of the moves in equity markets and risky assets has been driven by duration. And how do you know that? You just look at credit spreads. And credit spreads have not moved yet, uh, meaning most of the moves in corporate bonds, even though you look at LQD, which is the investment grade bond ETF, and it's now at 2009 levels, um, most of that move has been driven by the move in interest rates on the long end, particularly on the 10 year. And so we're yet to see that that risk of default being reflected in those, in those instruments. We haven't seen any of that yet. And that's when things become very dysfunctional. In fact, that was exactly when uh, back in March 2020, uh, most of those instruments were collapsing and the Fed actually had to announce that they're going to buy those instruments in order to, uh, uh, to help them, to support them. And so I don't think we've seen any of that yet. Um, in fact, we've seen parts of it today uh, or on Friday with Janet Yellen uh, beginning to talk about uh, her worries about liquidity in the treasury market. But there is a difference here to be made. Uh, it's not necessarily that she's worried about the level of interest rates. She's worried about the liquidity aspect of the treasury market. And so I think that that's, a, you know, that that's yet to become a problem. I think she's getting ready for issues like the BOE had. And the, just the example of the BOE, uh, what's happening in, in UK it's very important because it's the first time in a very long time that we've had, you know, the real so- sovereign risk of default being priced in markets in a very large way. We mm. haven't seen that in many, many years. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of breaking correlations and some of them are being caused by the way investors are behaving according to the data. And I think things are starting to break from a sovereign debt risk perspective and that we are yet to see the corp- corporate side of it uh, show some issues too. The corporate, um, the corporate bond market has been a problem for, for many decades. Uh, I'm actually very surprised we have not seen uh, uh, that part of the market breaking. I thought that part of the market could actually break first, not last. And so, you know, right. you would at least, at least imagine the zombie corporation part of it, you know, would, would have been one of the early victims, but we, we haven't really seen that reckoning hit there yet. Yeah, I mean, we've been we've been you know trying to to express that view in the markets, and it it's, it hasn't been bad because if you look at the instruments of of junk bonds or investment grade bonds, they've been declining. Don't get me wrong, but they haven't really been flushed out like we saw in other recessions during very big turmoils in in global markets, and so I think we're yet to see that as well. So. I'm, I'm not. To me, as, as an investor, is is one of our focuses is to finding uh, those uh, those instruments to be to be short. And I think that that's one. You know, you can hedge the 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 the, the treasury side by being long treasuries, not because I'm bullish on treasuries, just so I can get that spread of of the default risk being reflected in corporate bond markets. And once that gets reflected, then you have the big spike of credit spreads. And so that's one way to uh, that, that I think uh, one, one could actually uh, really position themselves uh, accordingly. But there are a lot of things to be doing here. And, you know, the, the situation, you know, with, uh, with other bond markets, uh, you know, this is very special when you, when you, when you, when you see bond markets collapsing with, with equity markets. And it makes me think, imagine if you were a pension fund and you had 40% of your, of your, of your book uh, on on something that supposedly uh, was had to act as a low volatility instrument, and instead you're seeing quite the opposite. 
it really makes you rethink about what, how would you, how would you change that portfolio allocation going forward? This is the real break of, of the, the conviction that we had in the 60, 40 portfolios. And what does that mean to portfolio positioning in the next 10 years? It's hard to believe that gold is not going to, you know, play a role here. So with all this happening is, is actually, there's a lot of opportunities and I know I've been saying this for a while. I mean, I, I look at silver markets where I've been calling for silver markets to go up for the last, uh, uh, you know, three, four years. Uh, and, and we've caught parts of that. It's been great. Uh, but then the last two years have been, have been brutal. I mean, we haven't seen much of that uh, movement uh, yet. And it's, it's, we know it's cheap. We know the metal still looks cheap relative to other things. Uh, but, but because of the, the, the setup that we've had, of the change from, from, from ultra dovish to now ultra uh, 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 Titan policy uh, in, in, across the globe, not just in the US. It's just, you know, it's been very uh, difficult to be a silver investor, but those things are about to change in my opinion. I think the worst is behind this uh, for most of those, of those instruments. And so I'm, I'm very bullish in, in, in some parts of the market, but I think there's more downside in other parts. So, you know, I've been hedging that portfolio for a while where we were long commodities, but also short equities in general. And I think that's probably one of the most interesting charts and best ways to be positioned, uh, but also where the real opportunity lies ahead. Remember, inflationary environments really favor owning tangible assets. It's hard for me to believe that gold and other tangible assets won't play a role uh, in large portfolio and large capital allocators when they're facing uh, that degree of, of collapse from their own hedges. You know, they're being pressured to adjust their own portfolios and they're yet to make those changes. And so I think we're seeing, that's why we're seeing those huge breaks in correlations um, you know, from bond markets versus gold, from Japanese yen versus gold again. Um, and we're seeing things like the risk of, of, of big deep pegs in currencies, like the Chinese yuan uh, that is off the radar in terms of what's happening, uh, in terms of their uh, devaluation that we're seeing there right now. And no one is really talking about it. Um, and then you have uh, you know, the, the risk of the Hong Kong dollar, uh, the, the opportunity in the Brazilian market. So there's a lot of new things, new ideas emerging uh, that are you know, getting more and more uh, conv conviction over time as well. All right. Well, so, Tom, you've taken this into the direction that I, I wanted to bring it into, which is, OK, so what do we do about all this? So you've just mentioned um, a couple of things. Um, you've mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, you're 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 still quite bullish on the hard assets trade. Uh, you just said you think the precious metals are, are, are going to come back to life uh, at some point. Um, you look at the commodities to. Uh, uh, general equities uh, ratio and think and, and sounds like maybe you've taken some short positions um, in the the equity side of things. Um, I just presume um, uh, you know because bond yields are becoming so attractive right now that that adding bond yields into your adding bonds or at least treasuries into a portfolio right now maybe has a a nice ballast role to play. Um, I, I guess I guess let's get sort of officially into this discussion here, which is. Um, you know, for the folks that are watching this channel, which are regular investors, just trying to first not lose a ton of money in what's coming, and then hopefully prudently grow their wealth. Um, where do you see the biggest opportunities? Well, I think I think if you are of the view that we have been entering, have been because it's been happening for the last two years in the inflationary environment, you have to. Our interview with Tavi will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. Remember, we're continuing our new practice of publishing my top takeaways from these weekly interviews. So to get mine from this interview with Tavi for free, just go to Wealthion.com slash Adam's Notes. 
And finally, if the challenging macro outlook that Tavi's detailed in this interview has you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends and risks that Tavi's mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of our interview with Tavi Costa.